Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this very exciting stream where we're going to be talking to the one and only Ron Gilbert. Looked over there, I see in the background by Stan. <laughs> Yes, Stan will make a guest appearance. Excellent. Well, you know, you can't really have a Monkey Island without Stan. So um, very pleased to hear that. Uh, let me just go into the game. I'll put the um, music on just slightly so we've got that underneath. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Ron, uh, for, for coming on and yeah, doing my, this. My, my pleasure. Um, I really liked the, the interview you did with, uh, with Dominique. That was really great. Well, he's a great guy, isn't he? So it's, it's very yeah, easy. Yeah, he is. To, to speak to someone like that but yeah genuinely really appreciate it um i i guess if it's all right we'll we'll start with from from the beginning um at what point did you decide for definite yes i am going to be making another monkey island because i i think we realize now you'd been thinking about doing it on and off for a little bit but what was kind of the catalyst from thinking about that and then going yes this is actually happening well, it was, it was kind of a slow process. Um, you know, I've, I've wanted to make another Monkey Island for quite a while, but I really wanted, you know, the kind of freedom to make the Monkey Island I wanted to make. And that was always kind of a sticking point because, you know, Lucasfilm owned uh, Monkey Island and then, you know, Disney bought Lucasfilm and, you know, these are very large companies and, you know, it just, it, it kind of felt like it was something I was never going to be able to do. Um, and then I think it was, I think it was in PAX in 2019, um, uh, a guy named uh, Nigel Laurie contacted me and he was, I believe, one of the co-founders of Devolver and he just wanted to get together and, you know, have a beer and chat and oh, I thought, yeah. okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> and, um, so we got together and he said that he knew somebody in the Disney licensing department that they were friends and he might be able to get the Monkey Island license. And so I was intrigued, but I think I was very cautious about that. And so I told him I, I wanted some time to think about it because what I didn't want to do was just go make another Monkey Island game. Yeah. I really wanted to make a new Monkey Island game that kind of felt special in some way. So I told him I needed to think about it and I thought about it for about a month or so. And um, at the time, you know, Dave Grossman and I have worked together on other projects. We'd worked on some of the games at Humongous Entertainment. He wrote Pajama Sam. Um, and we were, by coincidence, there was a project that he and I were working on about four months before um, Nigel contacted me. Um, it was a project that never came to fruition, but, you know, we were in contact and working together and designing stuff. And, and so I contacted him. And, you know, I said, hey, you know, what do you think about making another Monkey Island? And he was very enthusiastic about it, probably more than me at some level. Really? Um, I, well, I mean, I was I was still a little bit nervous about doing it. And so um, Dave, this was pre-pandemic when we actually get together in person, but Dave came up to Seattle and we spent um a, a weekend and we just talked about the game it's like if we were going to make another monkey island what would it be and we really wanted to make sure we had a good idea that we knew where we wanted to go with the game and after that weekend we both felt comfortable it's like yeah we we have a good idea we can do this and so that's when i went back to devolver and i said okay if, if you can if you can get the license then you know it's something that i'll do and then, you know, we spent the next nine months, you know, with lawyers haggling over contracts and stuff <laughs> okay, before yeah. we actually started. And then how do you go from that point to, you know, you're having to keep it a secret, essentially, from so many people, apart from the people working on the game. Uh, what was that process like? Did you, did you find that quite easy or was it difficult? Well, I mean, it's, it's easy for me. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm like really good at keeping secrets. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm not the kind of person that feels compelled to talk about everything no. and, 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 you know, blab about stuff. So it was easy for me. But, you know, we had a team of 25 people that worked yeah. on this game daily, right? They just every day showed up and worked in this game. And we, we needed to keep it 
a secret. And so that was, um, that was a little bit difficult, but it worked out well. I mean, I don't think we had any real leaks on the thing and uh, everybody on the team was wonderful, you know, at doing that. Um, I, I think it was kind of this, this low level kind of stress that I had every day for two years, which was that this was going to leak somehow. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but it, ne it never did. So I was very happy. What was the, I'm just making your face slightly bigger, Ron, because people want to see more of you. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cover up all the game as well, because we're going to be playing a bit of it. Um, I was, I, what was the best reaction you got from um, people when you told them? Who had the best reaction when you said, we're going to be making another Monkey Island? Oh, it was, it was probably, it was probably Dominique. I, yeah, I thought you were going to say that. You know, because uh, I, I think he's already told this story, but you know, he was happened to be up in Seattle, um, and this was maybe five or six months before we announced the game on the first of April. And he just happened to be in Seattle, and so I said, "Hey, let's get together and have coffee." And he didn't know I was doing this, and he knew I was kind of working on a new game. And we got together and had coffee, and. Um, and he was just kind of floored by the announcement. He just kind of didn't know how to respond to it. And I think that's the way a lot of people have responded. It, and, and I think that's kind of a testament to how, how well we were able to keep the secret, is when I did actually tell people because they were coming on the team or for other reasons, they really were floored. This really was like new information to them. And it was great. Yeah, I mean, I think it, and, and that's, I guess, the reaction you then had when it, when it, when it was announced all over again. You had to deal with that uh, <laughs> twice, almost. Um, we have right, a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and what was that like, I suppose? You mean the announcement on the 1st of yeah. April? Yeah, that was that was a little bit tricky just because of the, of the way calendars work. Because, um, you know, the 1st of April, I believe, fell on a, on a Friday or a Saturday. And so I could do the April 1st joke, but uh, Devolver didn't want to officially announce the game until Monday. Right. Um, just, just for press coverage and all these other things, which totally makes sense. I agreed with that completely. But, you know, I, I kind of wanted the April Fool's joke to last a day, and it ended up having to last three days. Yeah. So that Same. was the only part of it that I kind of didn't like. But other than that, I, I think the whole April 1st thing worked um, worked out really well. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a cracker of an April uh, Fool's, but it wasn't an April <laughs> Fool's. Um, yeah, it was really good. Um, I'm going to go to, I'm going to dip in and out of people's questions. Um, uh, one we've got here um, from Yak Waxlips saying, Ron, which characters from the Monkey Island series were you tempted to put in Return, but never found a reason to, so didn't? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's that's a hard question, just because we, we really... It's like it's not like we made a list of the Monkey Island characters and we're like, okay, well, how can we work this one in? How can we work this one in? I think Dave and I really started with you know, the story. We just, we told the story we wanted to tell and where the Monkey Island characters fit, we would put them in. So it really wasn't a matter of, of you know, cutting a bunch or including a bunch. It was just whatever the story needed um, for those characters, we put them in. I mean, I think obviously Dave and I favored characters from Monkey 1 and Monkey 2 just because that was the game that we had, you know, we, we, had, we had done. And so that was kind of, I think, the focus of our attention. But, you know, Murray is such a wonderful character. I think we both absolutely wanted to have him in the game. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I, I think he's he's such an excellent part of any game that he's in. Uh, he, he's just played so well. Uh, I think, yeah, he's probably one of my favorite characters. Um, I want to now, I've kind of, in my head, split this up into five chapters, much like uh, Return to Monkey Island. And the next chapter I kind of want to go into is the beginning of the game, because I think it's a really interesting... Uh, bit of, of the entire uh, uh, the beginning and the ending both are quite big talking points I think um, and I, I kind of just wanted to go into the fact this how you know you managed to do this kind of get out um, <coughs> of <laughs> going into uh, going from Monkey Island 2 and into this so we see this scene we, we hear these kind of familiar words 
um, of uh, supposedly Guybrush and, and Le Chuck, uh, which is obviously the ending of Monkey Island 2. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just really interested. Why was it important to start off right when Monkey Island 2 finished? Uh, and did that make it quite difficult? <laughs> um, it was important to me because I've always said for a long time that if I did another Monkey Island, it would start right at the end of Monkey Island 2. So that was an important thing for me to do. And it really was the one thing that I, I absolutely wanted to do. Um, so that was kind of a stake in the ground. And when Dave came up to Seattle and we first started talking about Monkey Island, let's go. Um, that was that was a big point of discussion. It's like how how do we start this thing? Yeah. And we probably spent a good day just you know hashing out different ideas and talking about different things and figuring out you know what we wanted to do with it. And it it, it wasn't a tricky problem. It was a fun problem. Yeah. Okay. To, to work with. And how did you come to to, to this point? Then I'll, what I'll do is I might actually just uh, so that we can. Because uh, we can see the text as well, so um, I'll just pause it for now. But uh, I'm just kind of showing a little bit about what we were talking about there. How did you? Were there any other, um, I, I guess, ideas that you had about how it could start, or how did you come upon this one? That oh, it's actually Guybrush's son and his friend playing. How, how did how did that one come about? And were there any others you had as well? Yeah, that was a very early idea as yeah. we, as we were talking about how or we're gonna you know, work our way out of this ending. And, and I don't remember who came up with the thing that it was, you know, Guybrush's son. Yeah. But once that was said, it just clicked. It's like, we just knew, okay, well, this is the right way to do it. So then it just became, how do we end up doing that, right? How do we tell that story of his son um, and the switch from you know, it being, you know, Guybrush as a kid, which was kind of implied in the second game. How do we do that? That, that I think was, you know, took up a lot of the discussion. But I mean, once we, once we launched it on, it was going to be Guybrush's son. We just kind of knew that that was the right, the right solution. Because the, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting really, because the yeah, 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 Guybrush's son is sort of a, the underpinning for the whole there. game in a way, dogs. because he's, retelling this story to his son no um so I, I, if you didn't have that element it, you know that no it would feel like a, a bit of a different game yeah it, re it really it really would have and I, I think that's why that element was so important and i think it's also why when uh you know dave and i landed on that it just made so much sense to yeah. do there really wasn't even a lot of debate about it once it came up I mean, the, it's interesting because it's, uh, you know, it's very much, and I think you do get this in a little bit in um, other parts of the of the games as well, but definitely in this one, the game feels very caught up in the idea of, you know, what is and isn't real, kind of the nature of storytelling, the real reliability of memory. So I, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on what are we being told here about Monkey Island 2? Was, was that just... In, in the heads of, of Boy Brush and, and his friend all along? Or, or what are we what are we to take from this beginning? Oh. Take from it. You oh, know, sorry. Definitely... Again, you just dropped out there. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Yeah. Okay. I think there's a lot of things that you can take from it. And, you know, all the different endings or the, or the 10 different variations of endings in the game, it really was... You know, Dave and I really talking about, um, you know, storytelling and nostalgia and unreliable memory. I mean, these were all things that Dave and I talked about at the very beginning of the game. Is because we knew we had this huge nostalgia thing that we had to deal with, and um, you know, storytelling is obviously very important to both Dave and I. And and as things developed, we kind of realized that we really had something just with that issue, right? Not not to just kind of brush it under the carpet or 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 um, kind of deal with it in an abstract way. It really became the focus of the story that we were trying to tell because we knew we had to deal with those issues with fans, and it just seemed like the most interesting story to tell in a way, but tell it indirectly through Guybrush and his and his son. 
I, I've heard uh, on a, a YouTube channel, um, they someone called uh, Return to Monkey Island, the story of the story of Monkey Island. I, don't, I wonder what you think <laughs> about that. I think that's great. You know, I think that's, um, I, I think that's a fun way to think about it. And, and I think one of the things that has really interested me about the game and the reaction of the game and the endings of the game is it has spawned so many theories about what it means. And to me, that's great because it gets people thinking about stuff. I've, I've never been a fan of, of doing stories that just have one pat ending to them. This is the ending. This yes. is the way it is. I think we, we, we could see that about I you, like, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I like endings that make you think. You know, I like endings that make you question a little bit. Um, and, I, and I knew we had that because, you know, we did a lot of playtesting with people where we, you know, we brought people in um, while the game was in development and we had them play the game and we watched them play the game and Dave and I took notes on everything they were doing. And when we got to the end of the game and we were able to have people test the end of the game, we brought these, these people in and they tested the end of the game. And the next morning we got an email from him, you know, saying, you know, he and his wife could not stop talking about the ending because they had all these weird theories for what is going on. And it was kind of at that point I knew, okay, I think, I think this may land correctly because people, you know, at least they were really, really talking about the ending. And that's what I wanted people to, to do. You said there you, you you think it will land. So was there a worry that it wouldn't? Were you were you concerned that you, you'd have to change it? Well, there wasn't a concern I was going to have to change it. I mean, I think anything that you're doing, right? Or you're writing a book or making a movie or doing, you know, a, a music. You're always wondering whether the idea you have and the intent that you have, is that going to land with people? And that's that's just always something you're going to think about. Um, we weren't going to change the ending. It's mm. like we weren't doing focus testing, right? Finding the, the most popular ending. This was the ending <laughs> that Dave and I wanted for the game. Okay, yeah. And it was, it was just about fine-tuning it. I mean, the, the actual end of the game, like the last 10 minutes of the game, we did a lot of work on that. And it was just, it was often just little, little things. Um, do... Does does Guybrush turn off the lights in the amusement park, or does Stan turn off the lights in the amusement park? Those are two different things that we we played with, and you know we played the game with Stan turning off the lights, and we played the game with Guybrush turning off the lights, and and you know Guybrush turning off the lights just felt better, you mm -hmm. know, to us, and so you know, that was the way that we went with it. So lots of lots of subtleties um, in in how how that ending kind of um, presented itself to people. So that's kind of what I mean by, you know, how it lands, right? You always do yeah. fine tuning to make sure, because we knew, Dave and I knew in our heads what we wanted the ending to be for people. And so now it's just fine tuning it to make sure that that is actually uh, getting through. I mean, speaking about fine tuning, I've just skipped to uh, Melee Island here, but in, in terms of, um, the writer's cut, which um, a lot of people didn't actually realize, I think, was a thing until maybe a little bit later on. I just happened to discover it before I played it because I was uh, looking at all the options. Um, tell me a bit about that, how you, why you decided to do that and how you decided what sort of stayed in and what didn't. Well, you know, again, with anything, right, no matter what kind of creative thing you're doing, you're always editing and you're always cutting. So, you know, we wrote a lot of dialogue and we, we did things. And then as you're playing them, you're kind of realizing, oh, the pacing is wrong here. Or maybe this is dragging on a little too long. So you were just cutting stuff. And we just cut a lot of stuff. And then, you know, David mentioned at some point, hey, what if we take all that cut stuff and we actually put it back in the game as a writer's cut? And that sounded like a great idea. So, um, and a lot, I mean, it's all just text. It's not like we had huge animated scenes that we had to, you know, recreate. Uh, so it was fairly simple to do that. So we just put a lot of that cut dialogue back in the game and did it as the writer's cut. Uh, we've got a question from Nuclear2K who says, would Return have looked any different if Curse and Tales hadn't existed uh, story-wise? 
Uh, story wise, I'm trying to. Well, I mean, obviously, Murray wouldn't be in. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's <laughs> one. Reason. And that's an integral um, part. Yes, I, do, I don't. I don't know how to answer that question, right? That is very speculative, and I don't know that I can kind of go back and and say, well, if these two things didn't exist, then this is the way it would have existed, because you're just drawing on this. There's a large amount of canon and a large amount of work that other people have done, and that just slowly seeps into your head. So I, I don't know that I can really answer that question. I think, yeah, you, you kind of did in the way, in the sense that, it, you know, it would have still been its own game, really, wouldn't it? It's just that because they existed, you did draw parts from it, because how could you, you, you didn't want to ignore them, I guess. Yeah, it's not like we wouldn't have made this game. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's just it's just pulling in pieces from that game or feelings from that game that uh, made sense. Now that we are looking here, we're on the well in Melee Town on Melee Island. I was I was kind of interested in, in this especially as sort of a, a, a metaphor for the game series in, in a way. In that you know things have there's been a lot of time that's passed since we first seen it uh in the secret monkey island uh it's, it's maybe looking a little bit older and uh, i'm just i wanted to know if that, was that a kind of conscious decision to sort of pair those two up yeah it was because it's a little it's it's kind of part of the theme of the game and it's a part of <clears throat> excuse me and it's a part of just going back to monkey island it's a part of that that, that um memory that people have towards things and how it's not not really accurate and it just it felt like do, having made that island be this place that was very familiar but not familiar right that it was familiar but it had also changed over time just like you know dave and i have changed over time just like players have changed over time and so that's really what we were trying to do by having made that island be similar but not you know, you can still go to Stan's shipyard, but it's all closed down. The church, as you see right here, is all boarded up. Um, so that's really what we were trying to do with Melee. And and that sort of feeds into a little bit. The, another question I wanted to ask around uh, fan reaction to the game. Um, and obviously, there was lots of positive things that were said as, as this announcement was made. Um, there was some, in the minority, kind of a negative reaction to uh, some of the artwork. And I, I just wondered, were you ever expecting to, to get that side of things? Um, and, and a little bit kind of like, how deeply did that affect you? I, I knew that we were going to get some kind of a reaction because it was not pixel art. I think so many um, diehard fans really expected it to be pixel art. And especially when, it, when they, they were thinking that it was going to start right after Monkey Island 2, well, of course it would be a pixel mm, art. And yeah. um, I had you know, said some similar things on my blog about, you know, if I made another Monkey Island. So I knew that that was going to be an issue. And I, I knew that was going to be um, something that fans did re react to. So that was not surprising to yeah. me. I think what was surprising to me was just how vicious those attacks were. It wasn't that uh, we wanted to be a pixel art. It was like, we wanted to be a pixel art, and you're the most horrible person in the world for doing that, and your whole art team are like, horrible human beings. And that was the part that really surprised me, which is why I really you know, stopped posting on my blog, because my blog was just filled with horrible comments from people. Um, a lot of them I had to delete. It's like you, they, they were so bad that I just couldn't even leave them up. So... Um, that part really did surprise me. Yeah, I'm sorry you had to go through that. And I think, you know, lots of people in the chat saying they loved the artwork and, you know, it was a disgusting reaction. Um, I did, were there any moments where you, you felt like you, you just didn't want to continue working on it? Or did it, it <laughs> never got that bad, I hope? Well, you know, by the time we announced the game yeah. on the 1st of April, the game was essentially done at that point. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, don't think, I don't think we could have stopped working on it. And 
Um, we certainly couldn't have changed the art at that point, and nor, nor would I have wanted to. No, I mean, no, this, no. This was the art I wanted for the game. It's like I really loved Rex's art, and I sought him out, you know, as the art director for the project. And so it's not like I felt like, oh, I made a mistake at all. It was like I totally stand by this art, and I love this art, and this is exactly the art I, that I wanted the project to have. Um, it's just kind of getting through that fan reaction but you know i think that's kind of you know normal certainly for the age that we live in right the age of twitter and social media mm. that everybody has a has a blowhorn at this point so no matter what they don't like about the game they can scream it to a hundred thousand people um and not only that they can scream it to you as the creator and I think that's one of those things that you just you just have to get used to in in the modern age of things that that's just going to happen yeah I, I guess that's fair enough but obviously still not great that you had to go through that it shouldn't happen even if it's something that we expect um i've got a, a question here and this is actually one i wanted to ask as well uh, we were talking about the writer's cut and kind of cut text but i'm also interested in other cut content because I'm amazed at how much kind of hidden things there are in this game. And I feel like there's probably more we haven't um, noticed first. Um, I'm interested about Cog Island, which um, some uh, super sleuths have found uh, exists on a map as a kind of island that I think was going to be used in the game, but then got cut. Um, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of hidden stuff in this game. and And... There is some stuff that people have not even found yet. Is there? And I'm just I'm waiting for people to <gasps> discover them ah! and figure them out. Are they big um, things or are they small things? No, they're they're, they're small things. Okay, okay. It's not like there's a whole other island people have okay. found. <laughs> it's it's small, subtle little things that um, I have heard no mention of whatsoever on Twitter or anywhere else. And I'm I'm you know kinda curious when those things are found. Um yeah, Cog Island Cog Island was an actual island in the game, right? It was going to be an island just like Terra Island or Bermuda or yeah. um, Scurvy. And it had a it had a little it had a very different design than the rest of the islands. It was more um, more mist like, right? There were no people on the island. It was all just these kind of mist like puzzles that you were doing. Okay. And And why was that? What was the idea behind that? I think it was just, it was different, you know, when yeah. we started designing, we just thought, oh, cool. this will be a different place than, than everyone is used to. And, and that, and that seemed fun at the time. Um, then as we were putting everything together, um, we just, we were starting to realize, you know, given the amount of work we had to do the game done and getting the time frame we had to do with the game, we kind of felt like if we included all of Cog Island, that was going to take a lot of time away from polishing the rest of the game. And we made the decision to just cut the whole thing. Right. Um, it was not an easy, easy decision to no. make, but it was one of those decisions um, that we made. And the other thing that I think you notice if you go to Cog Island and you, you walk around it or swim around it or whatever kind of shows <laughs> is underwater, um, is you know the art is very simple and one of the things we did with this game was very early on like probably four months after we had started the game the entire game was playable from beginning to end oh, okay. and all of the art in the game was just this more kind of simple um we call the thumbnail art everything was all thumbnail art so the artists would go through and just quickly do the rooms we would put color down on things and the whole game was like that. And so what you're seeing uh, when you go to Cog Island is um, is very much the way the whole game looked at that point. And so when we cut Cog Island, we weren't cutting a whole lot of work, right? Because it had just been sketched in um, just the, you know, the, the, the core of the puzzles had right. been done. So when you're cutting something, and I think that's important, right? Because when you know when we were making the original monkey island if we wanted to cut something we were cutting essentially finished art at that point and it made it made cutting things 
and editing um, really um, very costly. And so we wanted to make sure with this game that we were doing something where we built the game in this thumbnail art. All the big animation scenes were all done as storyboards. Okay. And, and it became cheap to kind of cut and edit. I'm interested as well about Terror Island. And someone in the chat has also asked about this too. Um, is there, you know, was there originally supposed to be a bit more there? Because I, I think compared to maybe one or two of the other islands, it feels like obviously there's that great bit with the Herman Toothros and all that bit that you've got to find him. But then the lead up to that, it, it feels like maybe was the, there originally supposed to be a bit more going on? No, this was this was the way it was really designed. You know, we didn't cut anything off of this island at all. Oh. The focus of this island really was those twisty caves yeah. and Herman. That's what that's what we wanted the focus of this island to be. Um, and it's, I mean, it's done brilliantly, and I, it kind of leads on to uh, another question I have really about Guybrush himself in this game. And I saw quite a funny post uh, on Reddit that was talking about him. Uh, as a kind of chaotic, neutral character. Um, oh, yeah, and, I saw that. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> is he, you know, as in, he's not evil. You know, he won't murder <laughs> anyone, but he is obsessed with getting what he wants, and that is the secret of Monkey Island. And he'll kind of... He doesn't really mind if he, you know, ruins other people's lives to do that, like with <laughs> Herman Toothrot, who he just leaves uh, on his own down there with, the <laughs> with nothing to do. Um, and I just kind of want to know, you know, is Guybrush all right? Does he maybe need to see a therapist? Does he need some help? It, <laughs> it feels like he, he's, he's got some issues that need working on a little bit. And this game, I, I feel like in the other games we saw that and it wasn't really commented on. But here it's definitely trying to hold that up. Yeah, Guybrush is, I mean, like you said, he's not evil. No. Right? And he, he just doesn't think think through things far enough to understand the implications. It's like I've always thought about Guybrush as like a really wonderful dog. You know, he's just <laughs> he's happy about everything and he doesn't really think about the stuff that he's doing or how it might be impacting, you know, the, the humans in his life and and so in my head it's like Guybrush is just is a really, really fun dog that totally loves you but isn't necessarily going to do things for your benefit yeah and i think that kind of ties in with the sort of chaotic uh neutral because he is very chaotic in, in this game there's there's lots of things that he does um we've got a, a sort of uh comment in the chat saying uh, i thought that was leading to elaine ditching him and it is interesting his relationship with with elaine in this game i, I kind of feel like it, it feels a little bit different she she feels a little bit softer on him than than previous games um was was that kind of the intention and and why well the, the relationship between Gabrish and elaine actually went through a lot of changes you know as we were making the game um the very first idea that we had was that Gabrish and elaine would kind of be split up right they wouldn't be divorced but they would definitely be on the rocks you know with each other and that seemed interesting uh, to kind of you know, be able to write that and to be able to deal with that. But one of the things we realized very early on as we started to get some of those scenes in is it just, it, it felt wrong for us. Um, Gabriel and Elaine, they should be a happy couple together. And so we really kind of abandoned that path um, very early on because it just, it didn't, it didn't feel like Guybrush. It didn't feel like Elaine, you know. Um, and with her, it's like, you know, we talked about, well, you know, is, is she going to be this, you know, big pirate like Gabrush is? Is she going to do all those things? And we really wanted to make her, that she was actually kind of more mature in these games. That, yeah. that, that she had moved on, right? That she had, she was now doing things that she was, um, you know, these social programs with getting, you know, dealing with scurvy. And it was really kind of about her kind of maturing and growing out of that. But as you can see later on in the game, she can still wield the sword. She's still, you know, probably a much better pirate than Guybrush is. She still has all that, but we wanted her to be more than that um, in, in this game. 
it's interesting, yeah, you say about Elaine moving on. It almost feels like in, in this game, everyone's moved on. And I don't know if that's just because of the way it's told. Whereas in, in the first one, you, you're kind of behind Guybrush, you know, trying to find the secret of Monkey Island. And it feels like everyone is interested in him doing that. On this one, nobody cares <laughs> really about the secret. And it's the same with LeChuck as well. They're both desperate for this. And LeChuck's crew mm. couldn't care less. Anyone else couldn't care less. So I, I, I just wondered, um, I, I guess, uh, why you decided to, to paint it that way. Again, I think that just goes back to the major themes of the game. Yeah. And you know, where, where Dave and I are in our lives and where, you know, fans are in their lives and everything that is just, it, it, just kind of dealing with, with the secret that way, just, you know, made, um, just made a lot of narrative sense to us. Um, and looking here, I've got on the screen, it's obviously, uh, I, I really enjoyed this <laughs> part of the game where you get LeChuck's diary. Because you don't really get to see much of an insight to, into LeChuck in most of the the previous games. He's just kind of painted as the baddie. So, so did you want to give give him a bit more of a, a you know, open him up a bit more to um, players as well? Yeah, I mean, in, in the previous games, or at least the two that, you know, I had worked on, LeChuck really was just this cartoon character. Yeah. And he, was a, he was a character of a bad guy and I, I wanted to explore him a little bit more as an actual character and the other thing I really wanted to do was really explore his his crew because even his crew in the previous games they were also just kind of characters of a crew and I, I wanted to you know have you actually meet the crew and interact with the crew and understand his crew um, you know, as as people or zombie people or ghost people, but you know, as actual characters yeah. in the game, what, what are their motivations? Like, why would you actually sail with a guy like LeChuck? Right? It's an interesting question, right? Why why do the you know why why did the henchmen always follow the Bond villain? You know, why do they do this? You know, and so I really wanted to explore this a little bit more, and with LeChuck's crew. Um, at the point we were starting the game, I was also watching um, uh, Black Black Flag or Black Flags. The was on HBO about the pirates, and one of the things I really loved about that show was that the crew always voted on everything. Okay, you know, that they they could literally vote the captain off the ship, and I found that fascinating. And I thought, well, that's a wonderful puzzle thing to yeah. do. And that's where that whole thing about you know when you want to go to Monkey Island, you have to you have to get all the crew to vote in your favor to go to Monkey Island. And I, I like that, and I think it also makes makes their makes LeChuck's crew um, s seem alive and, and give them a lot more depth. Yeah, and a lot of the people in the chat say they love Bob, and uh, I would second that. I think Bob is again. Although Gully as well is a great character, so I don't know. I, the, all the crew are pretty great, and I agree. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they they really are. I mean, I don't think there's any of his crew that I I dislike. You know, as a <laughs> as, as a, a storyteller and somebody to write for and and think of puzzles and everything. Yeah, they're all, they're all very wonderful. I mean, is there a character that you do dislike in the whole game? Yeah. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I was thinking, I, mean, I don't think, I, you, probably I, you don't dislike I think any as, of them. Yeah, as, as, you know, an a, a author of something, it's like, if you don't like characters, you get rid of them. You yeah. know, you don't, you know, you don't put up with them. Or if you don't like them, you don't like them for narrative reasons. You don't like them because they're supposed to be the villain. Yeah. Or they're supposed to be irritating. But then some of those characters you actually like because they're really fun to write. Um I think if you just dislike a character, you just you just get rid of them. Yeah, <laughs> if the, yeah, if they don't work in the story, then don't put them in. Um, I I'm now going to go to the ending. So spoiler alert if if people don't want to see this, but hopefully you've sort of caught up with it. Also, I, I like this um mechanic by the way of if you're going back into a loaded game, you get a little you can choose to remind yourself of what's happened. More games need to have that in them. 
for when people are away for a little bit and come back to a game. It's a really great mechanic to have. Yeah, we called that the previously on feature. Yeah. And it was <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun. It was it was a bunch of work to do and, and there were there were a lot of there was a lot of debate about what well, is this worth doing? Is this worth the work? But we had a lot of a lot of concepts when we were building the game we called quality of life things. Yeah. Because I think one of the things you, you you have to understand about a modern audience that's very different from the audience back in you know nineteen um, um, nineteen ninety is that there's so much pulling at our lives these days, and a lot of people that play games are not you know eight and twelve year olds, but they're you know thirty and forty year olds, and they have families, and they have work, and they have lives, and and we really wanted to kind of respect people's time with the game because we knew we weren't going to be your only obsession at the moment and we wanted to respect your time and so we had these quality of life type features and i think the previously on is one of those kind of quality of life features yeah and it, it works and yeah I, I noticed you've got quite a few other things like that in the game and uh yeah thanks for doing that because i i think it i know it isn't a bit of extra work but it is like really appreciated um <laughs> We are here in the in the sort of ending part now. It's all building up to this. Uh, then Guybrush steps out this door and he's back in a kind of amusement part of uh, Melee Island. Um, let's just go through this then. Let's unpick this. Um, how, how, how did you cut this up? Where, where did this come from? I, I, I kind of have my own theories about this, but I just want to hear a little bit your thoughts on it first. Yeah, I mean, there's something about this ending that I'm not sure that a lot of people understand. Okay, go on. And, you know, I mean, the original game was called The Secret of Monkey Island. Yeah. And we never really addressed what that sequel was in any of the other games. And when we started this game, you know, we said, well, we really need to tell people what The Secret of Monkey Island is, right? You don't want to just kick that football down the field another time. Yeah. You know, you really want to, um, I really wanted to say, you know what, I'm going to tell people what the secret is. And the thing that I'm not sure that people really understand is this is actually the secret of Monkey Island. As, as I conceived the secret, you know, in 19, you know, 88, when I first started working on this game and it got the title, the secret of Monkey Island, this was the actual secret of the game. It was the Guybrush was just in a giant amusement park. And that's where it got its title. And so, you know, when I when I when I thought about, you know what, I, I really want us to actually tell people what the secret is, this really is it. Um, that that whole concept was kind of abandoned early on in development as you know the game started as the original game really started to to take fruition. Um, but you can still see that, right? The grog machine in stands, um, you know, those little hints here and there. So it's not like those things are just put in as jokes. They, they were a continuation of the fact that this is actually the secret of Monkey Island and, you know, Guybrush is just in an amusement park. And so, you know, when, when Dave and I decided, you know, let's just tell people what the secret is. And we debated that a little bit at the beginning. Maybe we don't tell them what the secret is. Um, but we, we felt early on, we just, we need to actually tell people what the secret is. And this is what it is. Because I've seen some stuff on Twitter where, you know, people talk about, oh, we just, we just made this up at the last minute and, and whatnot. But it's not. You know, this, this really is the secret. This is the thing that people have spent 30 years wanting to know. I always got asked, what's the secret of Monty Well, This is it. This is it. Um, did, did it feel, I, I wonder, I know some people, I think someone mentioned this uh, in the chat as well about, some people were expecting some kind of bigger confrontation between LeChuck and, and Guybrush at the end. What, what do you think about that? W would that have added anything to the ending? Or did you think about that when you were making it? Yeah, we, we did think about it. We had some, you know, some early concepts and some stuff where there was more of a confrontation with LeChuck. And 
we we ditched it because we really felt like that kind of takes away from the ending. We didn't want there to be a big confrontation. We wanted this to be, um, I mean, I don't want to say anticlimactic because that's the right word, but we wanted to be building and building and building and building. And then when you got to here, just take the air out a little bit because he's just in an amusement park and this stuff. And it felt like having a big confrontation with with Chuck would distract from that in in some way. So, you know, we have Chuck is is working uh, on the code wheel while you're making your way down the rings. So there's still that tension between the two of them, um, but it's not a direct confrontation. And, you know, we've had so many games where the end of the game was a direct confrontation with Chuck. It's like, well, let's do something different. Um, I, I'm just gonna. I'm looking at chat, and uh, Happy Golden Sunshine has got two interesting questions. Saying, "Is the secret for us, or is it for Guybrush? And does he know he's in an amusement park?" I think I kind of know the answer to the second one, but uh, interested in your thoughts. Um. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't. I don't know that. Uh, in the original, you know, nineteen, you know, nineteen eighty-eight version of the game I was constructing, he did not know he was okay. in an amusement park. Yeah. And that's that was his his source of discovery throughout the game was it was all an amusement park, and Stan was not the leader of the amusement park. There was another character that was the leader of the amusement park, um, but you know he kind of did not. He did not know that he was in it. I, I think kind of the interpretations, I mean, there's a lot of interpretations of, of what the ending can be. Yeah. You know, based on those 10 different things. I mean, you can even follow some of those, some of those through and go, oh, he's not in the amusement park, right? It's just a weird story he's telling his son. Um, so I think you can kind of look at it a lot of different ways. Yeah, totally. And I guess that must have been what you were going for. Like you said, you didn't want a definitive ending, really. Well, yeah, we wanted to kind of get back to the core of the themes of the game, of storytelling. What does storytelling mean? And what does memory mean? And what does nostalgia mean? And, you know, is Guybrush even remembering his adventures correctly? And, yeah. you know, is he telling his son just made up stories or is he misremembering the stories there's just there's there's a whole lot of nuance to that um that i didn't really want to come down and say this is the way it is and i look at those those 10 different endings um and in my mind there's one of those endings that is canon right there's one of those endings that is exactly the way i think of of the game and it's it's probably a different one for Dave, and it's probably a different one for other team members. But I'll never say what it is ah. because I, because if I if I say which one of those endings in my mind is canon, then it will become canon. Right. It okay. will just be the definitive truth, and I don't necessarily want that. Okay. Fine. You you tease us with that. I was I was hoping you would say. I think I kind of have an idea w- which one might be canon, but um, I step it's the one I chose for sure. Well, uh, which 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 one in your mind is canon? The one. Well, the one I chose was that he uh, told his child um, that this is exactly how this happened. Um, uh, yeah, that um, he, you know he he says. Um, that you know you you you're terrible at endings you make terrible endings and he said no that's all exactly true this is what happened um but you know i don't know what you think about that ending but anyway (laughs) um uh, people are saying by the way that they love the t-shirt and the idea because i guess this uh, it's interesting that you know i suppose because you called um you know the first game the secret mug yarns you've kind of been given this rod for your own back in a way and that you had to talk about the secret in some way but it, it sounds like you you did want to you wanted to finally give that back to the fans and explain to them what it was you've been waiting for a long time to say actually this is it yeah and i think the 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 t-shirt thing is kind of a callback to monkey on yeah. one or gabrish digs up the treasure yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. i found the treasure in the island and all those stupid t-shirt and you know when we were doing the ending and you know we spent like i said earlier we spent a lot of time playing around with the ending and you know the, there wasn't always a t-shirt in that treasure chest 
Um, there was a point where that note that you find in a scrapbook, you know, after you've completed the game, that that was the thing that was in the treasure chest. Oh, and, okay. And so, you know, as we kind of go through all these different permutations of where things are and, and when you discover things and who turns off the lights, you know, you're just trying to feel your way around that to see which which thing is kind of having the most impact in your story. And, you know, we, we eventually realized that we wanted the note to be in the scrapbook because if the note was in the game, it felt like it was something Guybrush was reading. You know, he took this piece of paper out of the um, out of the chest and he read it. Now, Guybrush read that note. And that note is clearly from Dave and I, right? It's not yeah. from a character in the game. And pulling that out of the game fantasy and putting it in the scrapbook, I think just made that note make a lot more sense for us. Yeah, I think totally. That would have been, even for you, Ron, that might have been a weird <laughs> breaking of the fourth wall if we'd had the scrapbook note in the chest. Yeah. I mean, I, you would have made it work, I'm, I'm sure. But yes, it would have been, I, prefer, I think I definitely prefer it being in the scrapbook. I think, yeah, it, it was nice to have that as an extra sort of feature um at the end um we, we have a, a question from pieces of kate who says i felt a bit melancholic at the end is that how you felt when you finished the game oh. um yeah that's that's a that's a good that's a really good question um I, i'm gonna i'm gonna answer that question as yes but i i think it's a yes because it's not like there's a definitive end of the game. It's not like I wrote the last piece of code and last piece of dialogue and went, okay, game is done. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Finishing the game is this long, slow, drawn out, painful process of fixing bugs and all this stuff. So there, there is no moment that is the end of the game for me. But if I do look back at the game, um, I, I would say that's, that's probably a fair assessment. Yeah. And, and I, I look back I... at it very fondly you know and that scene of guybrush at the end you know staring into oh. the distance after everyone leaves um in some ways that you know that is me you know that is me just thinking about all this stuff um i'm going to go to a few more questions uh in the chat as well thank you so much everyone for all your questions we we've had many i'm trying to get through as many as possible but also having them kind of make sense uh, with what we're talking about at the time. Uh, let me just see. Yeah, a question here actually that's quite interesting from Levin CR9 who says, was, I think you might have mentioned this, but just to check, uh, was Stan behind the secret even in the 1989 concept? I think you said it was a different character. Is that right? Yeah, it was yeah. not Stan. I okay. mean, there was, the person who was behind the amusement park was the, you know, antagonist of the story that, you know, when Guybrush figures out he's in an amusement park, he's the person he's doing battle against. And I think that character slowly became more Chuck, um, you know, as, as we were, um, you know, kind of really, really working through the story of the first one. Oh, I but see. No, it wasn't, it wasn't Stan. No. Okay. That's, that, that's a, a short answer to the question, but that helps a lot. Um, a lot of questions as well, and I think we may as well, since we're kind of talking about endings and things um, about the the future of the series, are you planning to work on any more Monkey Island games? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think every game I have ever finished in my entire life, when I finish the game, it's like, this is the last game I ever want to make. I'm leaving the industry. I'm done with this stuff. Because it is, it is a really, really kind of hard and painful process yeah. to finish a game and so i have no idea what i'm doing next and i probably won't know for at least you know two or three months um what i wanted to do next so i don't know if there will be another monkey island you know from me or dave i'm sure there will be more monkey islands i think um i can't imagine that lucas would not want to make more monkey islands I guess yeah. Was the was what was the reaction from them? How closely were you uh, working with them? Did they have a lot of input on on what they wanted you to do, or were you kind of given basically free reign to do everything? Um, I think both. You know, I think we were we were given free reign to kind of make the game we wanted, but 
Um, we did constantly talk to them about stuff. It's not like we went off and made this game and then, you know, on, on April 2nd, we said, here, here it is. You know, yeah. this is the game. We're, we're constantly talking to them. And, um, you know, they, they had, we worked a lot with Craig Derrick, who uh, had been at Lucasfilm for a while, and he was responsible for the special editions. And he's a great guy, and, and he knows Monkey Island really well, and, and he respects, you know, the franchise. And so there was a lot of talking with them about stuff. And, you know, they, they came up with a lot of really good ideas. So it's like, oh, yeah, we like that idea. Let's go ahead and put that in the game, you know. And so... Um, I, th I think you know when you're working with anybody, whether it's a publisher or an IP holder or just or just your team or your testers or anybody, it's like you always just want to be listening to everybody's ideas and you know things that are really good and work well. You want to incorporate into the game. Uh, speaking of Craig Derrick, uh, we have a question from Aerial Racing who says uh, Craig Derrick tweeted about going back to the mansion. Anything you can share? <laughs> I think I can. I think the thing I can share about, um, you know, going back to the mansion and Guybrush cart racing and all this stuff <laughs> is I should stop making jokes on Twitter. <laughs> okay. So what does the, what do what what does that mean then, Ron? What do you mean by that? Uh, it means that I was just kind of making a joke about yeah. that stuff, and um, l like I said before, it's going to be a few months before I have even really thought about what I want to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm in some level, I'm still working on the game. It's like we're still kind of yeah. fixing little bugs that people are finding and you know, thinking about, you know, platforms and all sorts of different things. So I'm, I'm really not done working on this game. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair enough. It's only just it's only just come out. So I, I think that's uh, that's that's very fair. Uh, talking about kind of the future of this game, um, I think we had a question uh, I'm trying to find it now about um, the physical release of it and w whether that's going to be a thing in the future. Yeah, it's something we've talked about, and I'm I'm sure it will be a thing, but I don't I don't have any concrete information about that. I think if we do release it, it'll be it'll be like a collector's edition type thing. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm virtually sure it'll happen, but I don't I don't know when. Uh, equally with that, we've got some uh, 11CR9 who says, are DLCs with cut content possible? I've, I've been, I mean, I can't think of a, an adventure game that has had a DLC, but, you know, Monkey Island could be the one to do it. Well, doing DLC in a narrative game is is difficult, yeah. right? Because you're, you're telling a story. And doing DLC, you know, you just... What, what is that DLC to the story, right? Is it a new ending to the story? Is it a new area to the story? Um, and so it's it's a little bit tricky to do. And it's also incredibly expensive, you know, sure. to do DLC. It's not like you just grab a bunch of scenes and put them back together. Um, so we really have to think about, about that. And, and I think, you know, we did the writer's cut, which is kind of yeah, DLC I in guess, way. Yeah. <laughs> free DLC. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there will be DLC in the classic sense of the game. I guess, yeah, Pieces of Kate has corrected me, of course. I should have known this because I played it. Thimbleweed Park had a DLC. Um, it, was, it was really good. I really enjoyed that. Um, but yes, that's... Okay. Oh, this is the, the Ransom uh, uncut stuff? Yes. Um, and yeah. the Dolores, uh, where you had to go around taking pictures and for the right. newspaper that was, I mean I really enjoyed that but yeah I, I guess that's kind of a different that's almost like a side story really rather than cut content. yeah the, yeah the dollar stuff I is more of a companion piece yeah. than it is DLC and I mean the whole reason that I did Dolores was because I knew I was doing Monkey Island at that point um we had started that whole process of putting stuff together and I knew there were a lot of changes I wanted to make to the Thimbleweed Park engine um, to do Monkey Island. And it just felt like, well, I can just do this whole other game called Dolores. And a lot of the changes that I want to make to the engine, I can just do them here rather than waiting for the actual Monkey Island project to start and then sucking up that time to do all the changes in the engine. So in a whole lot of ways, Dolores really is is um 
is kind of our R and D project for the engine. Right. Okay. That's that's interesting. We're looking at kind of. Uh, just on the seat. So we've gone to the credits now. It doesn't mean that the, the interview is ending, but the credits are just up here because I've just finished. I went through the ending. But we did have a question, I think, about localization um, with the game. Let me see if I can uh, find that. And thank you very much, everyone, who's um, put in their questions. Um, Osirius or Osirius has said, uh, any chance we'll get voiceovers for different languages in Return to Monkey Island? My son loves to watch me playing games, but he doesn't speak English yet. It, it certainly is something we're talking about, but we don't have any concrete plans. I mean, doing a voiceover in a localization um, for this game is, is very, very expensive, right? Yeah. It's not something you just kind of randomly get your friends together in a microphone. So <laughs> it is something we need to take a lot of a lot of time and really think about. And we also want to do it right. I mean, the, the, we spent a lot of time on the localization for the English stuff and you know, Chris Brown was our audio director and she's absolutely wonderful and she's amazing at tracking down really good talent. And and if we were going to do voiceover in different languages, we want to make sure we're taking the same care as we did with the English stuff. Yeah, and I think that's that's fair enough because, you, like you said, you want the kind of quality to to um, show throughout. Uh, talking on the, on the subject of kind of DLCs, if you could pick one kind of side character from uh, the Monkey Island series to have their own sort of standalone game or DLC, who would it be? I think the game that I have always wanted to make is a game centered around Elaine, where Elaine is the main character and Guybrush is just the sidekick. Oh, that'd be great. Um, and I, I, I have always wanted to make that game for years and years and years. It poses some kind of problems because Elaine is kind of a very, you know, competent character. And I think adventure games work really well when the when the main characters are not totally competent. It's true. Because you're doing <laughs> you're doing very, very weird things in adventure games. And if you can work the weird things into the characters, into the story or the world, I, I do think it actually works better. I think that would be the challenge with Elaine is is how do you how do you put her in a game and still make her Elaine yeah. uh, and having to go through all the puzzle stuff. But but that that's kind of the game I would love to make is the Elaine Monkey Island. How, what what has stopped you from making that so far? Is it just kind of what you've been talking about, and that would be a very different approach to it? Yeah, it, it would. And I mean, I, I've spent, what, 30 some odd years not not being able to make another Mikey Allen. Yeah. And I just had to make one. So, you know, if, if it is anything, it would be kind of uh, in the future um, with that. Okay. I'm going to be five years on April the 1st. I'm going to be watching out to see <laughs> if this suddenly movie is the game you've been working on already. <laughs> Um, let me just see. Thank you, everyone who's been putting in uh, lots of questions. I, I really appreciate everyone taking part. Um, let me just see. Uh, more questions about the ending, if you don't mind, because obviously it's a big part uh, um, of the game. Everyone's kind of talking about it. I don't know if you will answer this, but um, I'm just going to throw it out to you anyway. JW Frosty says, does this mean none of Guybrush's adventures were real? And I, yeah, I kind of know what you might say about this, but I'd, I'd be interested to see. I think that's that's something that's kind of up for interpretation. Yeah, right? I thought I mean, you might say that. <laughs> of the ten endings, I mean, there certainly is an ending to the game that says, no, that is not true. Yeah. That they are just stories that he is telling his son. And and I think that's, that's a little bit left up to the players um, to kind of figure out. And like I said at the beginning of the of the stream, it's like I like endings that that are that that leave the viewer or the player um, kind of leaves it up to them to figure out what all this meant. And I I'm a huge fan of David Lynch, and I would I would challenge you to explain the endings of any David Lynch movie. Oh no, yeah, um, I couldn't. Because he just he gives you so much to think about and so much to go back and look and watch the movies again and go, well, what did this mean? What did that mean? 
and I think that's I enjoy movies like that I enjoy when I'm done watching a movie that I sit there and I have to think about the movie for a little bit you know what what did that actually mean um, and that's kind of what I've what I've liked to do with my game stories as well uh, what's your favorite David Lynch film I think probably Mulholland Drive it's good yeah i like that i think mine is probably blue velvet but yeah they're, they're both very um, good yeah i haven't thought about blue velvet in quite a while i haven't seen that one in quite a while i should go watch that again yeah it's uh well i, I recommend it ron you should watch <laughs> i know you've seen it already well, I've, I've seen it yeah, i just yeah, haven't yeah. seen it in a long time and, i mean there's a soft part for erasure head just because it's such a bizarre movie yes it is the baby is very interesting <laughs> scene in that um i another sort of ending question here um just saying are is there an ending that people haven't discovered yet i'm, I'm guessing everyone has that everyone realizes there's more than one ending now but are there any that people you haven't come across N not in the in the classic sense that we have those those kind of 10 endings okay there are lots of different weird variations yeah. i mean obviously Guybrush can die I mean, there's yes. an ending where he dies and none of this happened he never had a child and all that um so i think there's there's weird little subtle variations you can you can work your way into on things but it look I, I mean it looks like as far as i can tell i'm sorry i keep asking trying to get these things out of you rob but um <laughs> it <laughs> it looks like people have have found all of them have they um <laughs> I, i'm gonna say yes okay. but maybe not totally yes okay oh that's very interesting okay so there's maybe a a permutation or a, 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 a there's there's probably small variations okay. to things that people have not totally discovered <gasps> okay very interesting all right very interesting indeed um guybrush uh shg in the chat says we need to know how lechuck and captain madison ended up i mean captain madison is a very interesting character it's, it's worth just going in into them a little bit as well because mm -hmm. um I, I guess that, that they're only introduced, obviously, in, in this game. That They're kind of a large part of it, but they're also not, because it's really about Guybrush and the Chuck. And I, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on, on them as a character as well. Yeah, I, I think, I think again, is always about Guybrush and the yeah. Chuck, right? And they are the protagonists and the antagonists. And, you know, the reason Dave and I put, um, you know, Madison and her crow in is kind of a part of that change right we wanted to say well this is this is kind of the new pirates right this is the new yeah. game players you know in in some ways and so that's what we wanted to, them to be there they're chasing the secret but they don't really understand what the secret is right i mean they just kind of heard about it and they're they're chasing it because it's trendy not because they really care about it and so that's really what we we're trying to say with them yeah Okay, uh, yeah, and I, I think that kind of, you, you kind of need that person, like you said, that that's uh, basically saying, you know, we, we've moved on. Uh, so you can see how obsessed Guybrush and the Chuck are still yeah, with the old world. Um, right, I think I I, I realise we've had you on for about an hour now, and I don't, um, you know, I really appreciate you you taking the time to uh, chat with us about it all. Um, oh, Guybrush says, uh, Captain Madison, perfect story for a DLC. I don't know, we'll see. They're all obsessed with DLCs, Ron. They really want one. <laughs> um, I'll just yeah, see I think Madison and her crew would, would, would be a, more of a spin-off game yeah. than DLC. But they, they would be fun to follow. Um, a final couple of questions from people in the chat. Um, George Broussard, and, and this is kind of, we haven't really gotten into the the, the puzzles of, of the game, so I'll just do a little bit of this because um, I've not really mentioned this, but what was kind of the most, um, you know, difficult part of making the game? Uh, was it having to go back to, you know, what was already there and, and try and include that? Or, or what was kind of like the, the hardest area of that? 
you know, in, in making these games, adventure games, I think the hardest part is just the puzzles, right? There wasn't yeah. anything I thought you might say that. <laughs> about, about Return to Monkey Island that made the puzzles more difficult. It's just the puzzles. Um, and puzzles are always interesting because as a designer, it's sometimes very hard to to gauge puzzle difficulty, right? Because you you know the puzzles because you design the puzzles. And you're kind of having to rely on your instincts about whether is this a hard puzzle, is this an easy puzzle? And and that that I think is, is probably the most difficult um, part of that um, is definitely the puzzles and, and wrapping the puzzles into the narrative because I don't I don't like adventure games where the puzzles exist outside the narrative. Yeah. It's like the puzzles they it's like it's like my three rules are the puzzles should inform the player something about the main character they should inform something about the story or they should inform something about the world and if the puzzle is not doing one of those three things then it's just an arbitrary puzzle that makes no you know no sense in some ways so wrapping the puzzle design into the narrative is often very tricky to be able to do um, and in, in sort of uh, conjunction with that, uh, Kitty Games asks, um, I'd like to hear about how Ron arrived at some of the game's UI choices, in particular the whole hover cursor over hotspot system. Um, what other options were considered uh, and why were they rejected, if so? Well, we started the UI from, <clears throat> from uh, Dolores. And like yeah. I said, Dolores was, you know, in some ways kind of an R&D platform. And I had, you know, simplified the UI down for Dolores, you know, to not have the, you know, seven, nine, eleven verbs at yeah. the bottom of the screen, and to have have the verbs be a little more contextual. That, you know, when you mouse over something in Dolores, the only verbs that are there are the verbs that actually work, right? So it will say, open this, pick up that, turn off this. Um, so that was the starting point. And, and when we first started working on Return to My Gallon, that is the way the interface was. The interface was exactly like it was in, in Dolores. Okay. And as we started playing around with that a little bit more, um, we kind of realized we, do, we don't have to say, you know, open uh, the chest. We, we actually have this, a, a real sentence for this thing. And one of the things that's always been difficult about the verb noun sentence structure, I mean, going all the way back to Maniac Mansion, is it's very difficult for translators to do that. Because translators, there are lots of, there are lots of different rules for, for languages. I mean, English is an amazingly forgiving language because you can just, you can have sentences that really don't even make sense in English and it's still, it's okay for English. But you start to move to languages like French or German, you know, all, all the different objects are gendered, which changes whether it's, you know, an open verb or some other verb. And it's always been a, just a real pain for the translators. And as we started looking about, do we want verbs? And we just started playing around with, well, it's not going to be open chest. We can actually have any sentence we want here. And once we started doing that, uh, we also started to very quickly explore the whole idea that, well, maybe these sentences aren't UI, they're what Guybrush is thinking, right? This is his thoughts. So, so it's not just open door to the scum bar, but it's really, hey, I'm going to duck into the storm, into the scum bar. And once, once we did that, there was just this explosion of creativity because we realized we, we didn't have verbs downs anymore. We could just have actual sentences for what Guybrush is thinking. Yeah, it's a revelation. I mean, it's it's mad that it's not really been done before, really, because it, it just makes such perfect sense. Um, yeah, it was, it, it was fun to do, too. Yeah, I can imagine, because it just, like you said, it's, it looks like it just opens up the, the entire game and how you interact with it. Um, I, uh, Loomis, Loomis asks a question, where was Meat Hook? He's the only one of the original crew not to make an appearance. Yeah, he was, I mean, he was one of those things that, you know, Dave and I talked about him and um, 
we actually you know, had an idea for a puzzle surrounding him. It was never fully designed, but he was just one of those characters where he didn't fit the narrative. Yeah. And another thing that Dave and I talked about a lot, you know, was was the nostalgia of the game. And what we didn't want to do is just throw a bunch of stuff in there for nostalgia. Reasons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if if it fit the story and it worked for the story, then we would have those characters and those locations in the game. But we weren't just going to throw everything in that people thought. Like, you know, people are like, well, where's the rubber chicken with the pulley in the middle? You know, it's like, well, you know, that was a really, really fun idea. And it just, it didn't, it, it felt like putting another rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle in this game was just, was just fan service. And we didn't want to do just fan service. Unless it's something like Cobb, where you're doing fan service, you even get the achievement for fan service. Yeah. <laughs> but there was kind of this humor um, part of doing Cobb and fan service. Oh, I think there is a reference to rubber chicken and the pulley. Is it there? There's something like there's a chicken, and he says, "Oh, I would have put a, a pulley in it, and or something." So you, you get you get it in a little bit, I think. Yeah, yeah, we make references yeah. like that, but but not strongly. Um, I'm and, gonna. Oh, sorry, go on. I was gonna say things like like Meat Hook. Um, it's not actually called out as a hot spot, but if you walk on melee up to the place where where Meat Hooks would have been, Guybrush actually does reminisce about Meat Hook, and the same thing if you go to where. Uh, Captain Smirk's training quarters were, and you just stop there. Guybrush does say some things about those, so they weren't just kind of ignored. But yeah. we didn't want them, we didn't want to make them very prominent things. Um, I think uh, I I am aware that we we've kept you on for, for a, a long time, so I really appreciate you being on. I'm gonna I think leave it with this. Uh, uh, one question um, from David because I like this a lot um, saying can we have a real life Monkey Island theme park please <laughs> well I think I'm not the person you have to talk to about <laughs> that but I think that would be great wouldn't it I mean that would be that would it'd be coming in full circle then if we had that yeah it, it, it really would I mean you know Monkey <laughs> Island was, was very based on my love of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride yeah. and and just yeah just going all around I guess I guess my ultimate would dream would be that they tear down the Pirates of the Caribbean ride and it becomes the Monkey Island ride. yes that would be great you should uh, <laughs> if anyone's uh, if anyone's able to do that yeah matter completely matter um I think that's kind of... I'm sorry, we, we've not been able to get through all the questions, but we did have many, many questions. I hope I, uh, I've managed to at least answer some of them there. Um, I, I guess finally, Ron, what are you up to now? Are you just kind of working on little bits of the, the extra parts of the game that um, you know need fixing or doing? Or what are you up to? Do you have time to play games yourself? I Not, not right now. I mean, I'm still kind of working on the game a little bit and doing stuff here and there that has to be done so i don't i don't have a whole lot of time you know to, to play games i i think like a lot of game designers i know in the business we don't actually play a whole yeah. lot of games and i think a lot of times we don't we don't play the games in the genres that we make games for it's like if i if i want to relax and play a game I'm not playing adventure games. I, I, I like RPG games or I like World of Warcraft. And I think it's because they are so different from what I do, um, you know, eight or 10 hours a day. It's like, if I want to play a game afterwards, I'm going to play something different. Yeah. I think that's, what's, what's your favorite RPG? Um, well, I, I mean, I don't know if you want to consider World of Warcraft an RPG. I mean, it kind of is in some ways, but yeah, I I played the hell out of that uh, <laughs> that game, and I, I was playing you know the classic um, WoW that they just came out with, and then you know Monkey Island started up, and I had to just quit that cold turkey because uh, I knew that was just gonna completely distract me yeah. from that. Um, I do like the the old school Zelda games. Quite okay, a bit. yeah. You're not Enjoy the. Those. Um, I spoke to. Sam Barlow, who uh, made her story in Immortality, and he was really into Zelda as well. So it's clearly uh, an adventure game developer's 
uh, <laughs> one of their favorite games, it seems to be. I mean, it is, they are classics, so I can understand why. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's something pure about the design of those games, right? There's it's just the pureness of the design without all this craft that kind of gets built up with a lot of modern games. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, and uh, I, I guess it, in that case, you're 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 taking a little break from any future projects at the moment. Nothing you can you can say what you might be working on. No, I mean, like <laughs> I said before, I don't even think about this, yeah. you know, until I've had at least a few months to kind of relax my brain. I think that's fair enough. It's it's been it's been a wild ride, um, and uh, yeah, I guess we're just all very appreciative that you you did return to Monkey Island um, and made this game for us. So thank you very much. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to do. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. The most interesting like two years of my life, <laughs> or my recent life, has been making this game. Well, uh, we hope you make some more. Uh, do, uh, I guess, keep in contact. Um, thank you very, very much for coming on. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, no, thank you. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad to hear it. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, who's been uh, feeding me lots of questions as well. Uh, but yeah, thanks, uh, Ron. I'll, I'll, leave, uh, I'll leave you to Stan, I guess. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank thanks, you. everybody, for coming. Cheers. Well...